Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll be talking to Levon Bell. Hi, Levon. Hi, how are you? How are you? Good. It worked. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us and for accepting our invitation. I'm really excited to be in conversation with you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited. This is actually my first time going live on Instagram. So I'm excited. And yeah, I hope people <laughs> join us. And I'm sure it's going to be a great conversation. Yeah. So let's uh, start with the presentation. Um, let me see if we can. Yeah, we can start here. That's okay. your studio, right? Yes, it is. So I'll just, you know, introduce myself. I'm a visual artist based in the Virgin Islands. Um, my practice is multidisciplinary. I see my artistic practice as a way to develop knowledge, as a way to kind of investigate things. Um, and so I, it, it just takes different forms. And I do that first by take, doing a lot of research and then trying to figure out what is the best form the project should take. So I work with video installation, drawing, painting, I've done public art projects before, et cetera. And, um, I think that one of the most defining things or the thing, one of the transition points in my practice as an artist was the purchase of this abandoned um, structure that I bought in 2008 with the intention of turning it into a studio. And then shortly after I, I, I learned that it was a part of this long, um, very complex and fascinating story of a neighborhood that's called Free Gut, which is where the first um, free uh, formerly enslaved people were relegated by law to live. And this house is in uh, uh, an extension of that um, part of the town in Christiansand and St. Croix. Um, so upon learning about that, we can probably move to the next slide. Here's how it, this is what it looks like kind of now. <laughs> it's a more recent picture. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we could see how, you know, a lot of what I did was, you know, talking to neighbors, investigating more about the history of not only the building, but the neighborhood and why this area of the town was in this um, state of abandonment and neglect. And I think that uh, thinking very much about the materiality, because I did a lot of the work myself in the renovation, um, and then connecting that with the stories, I started to make these connections between materiality and narrative. Um, the house in some ways was an archive. And so I started mm -hmm. thinking about different kinds of archives um, and the different stories that you can find in materials. So yeah. I think we can go to the next one. Yes. Um, and so here um, outside my studio, I started finding these small shards of colonial era pottery. Um, the one on the bottom is, you could tell it's from the Royal Copenhagen and the one on the top is a little more difficult to tell but they kind of surface after, um, after it rains uh, here. Sometimes you also find them on the beaches. And for me, I saw it as this very interesting metaphor of these histories. They were like miniature paintings that kind of keep resurfacing. And the Virgin Islands, you know, we were colonized like many parts of the Caribbean um, several times. For us, it was about seven times, the longest being Denmark for about 250 years and the last being the United States for about a little over 100 years. Um, but these pieces of pottery, um, I started thinking about ways to uh, think through them um, as these fragments of our, our history that almost is like a refuses to be forgotten. Yeah. And so if we go to the next slide, you'll see that um, I started making these uh, large oil paintings, kind of piecing together various fragments. And for me, I saw it very much as um, like process paintings. I, I didn't necessarily have a thought out composition. It was very much about the process of imagining these from what was broken, from what I didn't know what the pedal would be like or what the pattern would be like, trying to imagine something new. Yeah. Um, Do you I, see this process also as a way of like healing history or like trying to like revisit some of these um, like past Histories. Yeah, yeah, in some ways, I mean, just like the the, the, the bodies that were uh, somewhat destroyed and broken down as a part of slavery and colonialism, these fragments that come up in a way like the detritus and the remnant and the signaling of that trade, of this vast transatlantic trade. 
And for me, it was a way of, yeah, I would say maybe a way of re repair mm -hmm. and healing that loss because, you know, there's so many parts of our histories that we will never be able to recover or parts of our identity, but we can begin to create something new. And I think that's very much a part of what Caribbean identity is, is about. It's about taking the fragments of our African or indigenous or European or Asian identities and creating something new out of that. I mean, yeah. you know, the Caribbean is the cross section of the, uh, the, all the major civilizations of the world. It's kind of the beginning of the quote unquote new world, what happened here. And so I think um, for me, these paintings were a way to think through that process and, and in some ways create a register of it. Yeah, we can see, we can go to the next slide so you can see more yeah, of the detail of the work. One. Yeah. Uh -huh. And if we go to the next slide, um, here's another version that I, that, uh, I had done recently last year in New York at uh, this place called Brookfield Place. Um, but instead of kind of creating these cohesive paintings, I decided to use the fragmentation as a part of the making of the work as well. So it's, I did them originally as diptychs and then kind of rearranged them so that this piece is, um, you know, it's maybe a new direction in that work. Yeah. We can go to the next slide. Yeah, we can see. We can go to the next one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it, there's an echo to this, but this work is actually earlier. This work I did um, in 2011 on my very first trip to Denmark. Um, and I had wandered into this store called the Royal Copenhagen and had this, um, in that store, it had this blue and white, um, you know, it's, it's like the epitome of luxury. It's like one of those luxury brand, uh, China wear, dinner wear types of stores. And I, when I went up to the top floor, it was a museum space. And in that museum space, um, they had one that was historical that had these plates that went all the way back to the 1700s. And at that moment, I realized that Cheney, um, which are those fragments that I, I had showed earlier, um, which I didn't mention, they're a hybrid word between China and money, um, but that those fragments that I was actually looking at the whole. I was looking at the whole plates of that, which I had never seen. Um, and that was kind of impactful for me. I just thought that, well, there must have been plates because we were a colony of Denmark for, you know, almost 250 years. There must have been some that dealt with the Virgin Islands. So um, what I had done, I mean, most people don't know that Denmark was a, a slaveholding uh, country or a, a, co a colonizing country. And they themselves don't kind of forget <laughs> that a part of their <laughs> of their history. And so this work, if we go to the next slide, you can see kind of a, I think there's a, oh no, I don't, sorry, we can go back. We can go back, sorry. Um, but this work, you know, I instead of doing these luxury porcelain plates, I decided to reproduce the images in their archive of plates that dealt with the Virgin Islands on paper. Oh, plates. okay. Um, so that's what this was. This was a reproduction of an art, or creating of a new archive and kind of reproducing the images that were on these plates on paper plates and very much thinking about the utilitarian nature of paper plates and how, mm -hmm. you know, that what do you do with paper plates? You use them and then you discard them. And that kind of signal not only um, what happened to us when Denmark sold us to the United States in 1917, but also kind of this discarded memory and this unforgetting that had happened. Yeah. So if we go to the next slide, so as I mentioned, I had wandered into this store in 2011, and in 2017, for the 100th year anniversary of the sale and transfer from Denmark to the U.S., I proposed to do, um, there had been like a commemorative plate that the Royal Copenhagen had done, and so I had pitched to them to do a version, which that original, like to do it in mass production was they weren't able to do that, but I was actually able to do kind of what was called an Unica series, mm -hmm. which for me was interesting because in a way now I'm inserting myself into their archive by mixing fragments of pottery that was not just from their company, but from other countries, Holland, England, etc., cetera, um, and kind of creating these same chainy like pattern designs. And I was able to do about 12, 12 original ones. I also learned through that experience working there. I worked there for about three weeks to make these plates. And then I had done another project um, where I was doing the, a commemorative owl 
like a, a prize that they give to a distinguished professor. Um, but while I was there, I definitely also understood things about my body um, mm. being in that environment and kind of yeah. really seeing my role as kind of an interrupter. And then also seeing how I, like a lot of these, um, the techniques and the flowers and the images come from Danish landscapes that I don't know. But what I realized is that my mark as a Virgin Islander, my experiences as, as a as an African descended woman, as a black woman, those, all of those things were kind of a part, my subjectivity basically became a part of me reinterpreting their designs. And that was very much felt when I was there working for sure. So that was, that's this piece. It was a series of uh, 12 plates on porcelain. They're beautiful. And did right. you ever, did you ever um, imagine them like in a table or just like? In, like... Yeah, I, it actually was for an exhibition that was going to be at the Christian Borg Palace. I negotiated with the Royal Copenhagen to sponsor the production of the plates for this other exhibition. And it was at the palace and the Queen of Denmark was uh, loaning out some of her furniture from the former Danish West Indies. And it was about this exhibition around again, the centennial that year, there was a lot of Danish institutions that tried to respond to the history. And originally I, you know, we were gonna do it in the dining room. And I remember when I talked to the creative director of the Royal Copenhagen, he was like, okay, we'll sponsor your production as long as it's not like a hundred plates. And I couldn't imagine a dining table that big. So I was like, oh, no, no, it's not going to be that. And then, of course, it was a hundred person <laughs> dining <Wow. room> table. <laughs> but I wasn't, there was no way I was going to be able to do that many. So I did what I could, which was 12, because they're all yeah. hand painted and it's hard. You know, it's really, you have to learn their whole techniques and learn how to mix everything. And yeah. it, it's, a, it's a process for sure. And you're doing it on glazed, curved surfaces. So yeah. it, was, it was a challenge. Also, a special blue, right? Because it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was able to do any color, but that indigo blue is the most popular color because it's the most stable color in fire. Yeah. yeah. So we can go to the next slide. Um, these are yeah, the, so the 12. The of the plates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're really gorgeous. Thank you. And the next work, I think it's yes, more... thinking about the more plates again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I had... Um, I, that work, the collectible, the ones that were on paper plates, I had an institution approach me to do, to either show that work, and I, I wasn't able to because it was, it had sold to an institution that had it on permanent display. And um, they asked me, you know, well, could you do something else like that? And so I went back researching and found that there were a series of plates that um, were created in the early 1800s by the Danish king to kind of show off his kingdom. And these plates, they were called the Desert Service Series. And, you know, dessert uh, at that time is the most expensive meal because sugar is these products that are coming out of the, uh, the colonies and out of the Caribbean. And it kind of really transforms the European palate. And it's a way for the king to show that off. So he decides to commission artists to do, they were about 80 something plates that he created of different parts of his kingdom. And what was so interesting is that even though they're about dessert and about sugar, and there were only, there was only one image created from the, about the Virgin Islands. And this is of St. Thomas. And so I thought, okay, I'll do what I did similar. I'll paint on paper plate. And I started on one small one and I just had the hardest time doing it. And part of it was when I looked at the image, I, the colors were off. I, I started, I was just like, what is, this looks, what, what is this? So I wrote, there was somebody who was doing a book that year on these plates. I wrote to him and asked him, I, there's something about this image that I find challenging and the colors in particular, do you know if those artists actually came to the Caribbean? And, and he said, no, you know, in none of their notes or any of their journals, he didn't see anything. And he said they likely just um, had created a kind of a composite image of some things that they had seen and kind of imagined, like it was an imagined uh, idea of what uh, St. Thomas looked like. And so if you go to the next one, you'll see um, an image from his book, I believe. This was the... Wow. The one of the landscapes that it was uh, that image had been taken from, and so if you go to the next slide, you'll see that I decided to create um, one more. 
do some more of the plates. I decided to, instead of doing it reproduced on one image, to kind of expand it. I think there's about 45 in this installation. And for me, it was, an, it, again, it was thinking, going back to this idea of the fragmentation, this mm -hmm. fragmented identity, um, uh, this, the imaginary and kind of sh changing that imaginary. Um, and I, I think what I also found interesting is, you know, I wasn't there to install the work. And I realized that once it left my studio, it would never look the same. Because, you know, just when you're trying to install all these yeah. plates, there can be, it's, it's <laughs> kind of the shifting yeah, so it, it made me think a lot about how the Caribbean has been often this kind of space to project one's imaginary and how it's those ideas are constantly shifting and how there could be holes and yeah. gaps and things like that. Yeah. Also, it's kind of, um, I mean, it makes me think about the violence of like another gaze, you know? Yeah. Forced upon you. Um, yes. And that is something that you always, or, well, you kind of touch upon on your practice. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a, a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, I, I mean, I have, I have, a, I think the next work actually speaks yeah. directly to that. Let me see if it's that's the one that comes up. No, not yet. Um, yeah, I do have a work that very much confronts the violence of that gaze. Yeah. Um, but this, this piece, um, it is inspired by again as i mentioned before um purchasing and renovating my studio i got a chance to really learn a lot about historical renovations and i started to see all the details in the buildings so differently and we have two beautiful historic towns on st croix um and this is from the town of Fredrikstad, which was burnt down in 1878 um after a labor revolt even though slavery had been abolished the conditions hadn't changed that much mm -hmm. so 30 years after there was a huge labor revolt that was that has been popularly known to many of the leaders were women. Women emerged as that, um, like Queen Mary, the, uh, who I, Jeanette and I did a sculpture um, in honor to. Um, she was one of the people that emerges as one of the leaders of this revolt. And what I thought was interesting is that our towns are called twin towns, meaning that one is called Fredrikstad, one is called Christiansted. They're both named after Danish kings. Mm -hmm. And... They all have the same names of the streets. They look very, very similar. But Fredrikstad looks different because of the history of this revolt. And it has this um, proliferation of these gingerbread fretwork. And you can see, I'll show some examples in the next few slides. Um, and I thought it was interesting how the um, history of the town was kind of marked in the architecture and marked mm -hmm. in this visual iconography of the town. And coupled with thinking about, if we go to the next slide, just the history of revolt, I wanted to see if I could develop a vocabulary around that. So when we think about revolts in the Caribbean, they were fought mostly with two weapons, fire and a cutlass. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even the Haitian Revolution was fought that way. They defeated the French army that way with those two weapons. And I wanted to see if I could create a, a vocabulary around that. So you using the patterns from these buildings and the history of the town, I start developing a series called Cuts and Burns. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is just some more examples of the patterns. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what I'm doing here is making small cuts and burns into paper. And as you can see, it's echoing the, the language of the architecture of this town. And I've developed it. If we go to the next slide, you can see I've developed it into different um, manifestations. This one is kind of a large scroll, a ledger, kind of thinking about another way of documenting this history of resistance. Mm -hmm. if we go to the next one. Um, this is another example of kind of a scroll-like one. And we'll go to the next one. And I've also done them in kind of a curtain installation format. And we could go to the next slide. And um, here, again, you see that I'm thinking about the architecture and the history to create these mm -hmm. small wooden sculptures. Um, this piece is called Constructed Manumissions. It looks very much like the studio that I'm in now that I showed at the beginning. Um, and I was, con manumission is a word that comes out of um, slavery where it's the process of becoming free. And so when I did a lot of research for the people who lived and owned this house, the first registered owners from 1777 
Um, she was African born, she survived the Middle Passage, survived slavery, was able to buy herself out of slavery and then own a house in the 1700s, which is quite uh, an, an accomplishment. But when you research that period, you also realize that a lot of these people that were free, they had a tremendous amount of restrictions placed upon them. They were not allowed to leave their house after 10 o'clock. They had to walk with their free papers. They couldn't gather in groups. They couldn't have certain businesses. They couldn't marry whites. They, they had so many restrictions upon them that I made me realize that these homes would have been so, such these sacred, special places for them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so this project, this, this piece, you know, it's, there's no nails or glue. It's actually created um, with these pins and the top roof, it's kind of held together by its own weight. So it, it's very precarious. And it's again, speaking to that fragility of freedoms and fragility of particular states of being, mm -hmm. which I think, um, you know, we could say, of course, that it can connect to what it maybe feels like to be an immigrant or what it feels like to be a person of color. I mean, there are many ways that I think people can have these um, fragile states of being and how do, yeah. you, how do you protect it? So what I like about this piece, when I first showed it, you know, I have this whole history spiel and I remember someone asking me, well, if they don't know all the history of what you're referring to, how does someone engage with this work? And I said, well, at my opening, there was a parent who told me that his son walked in and he said, oh, mommy, it's like a magic house. It's like a magic house. And I said, yeah, it is a magic house. And I thought, you know, because if all, if all you can see is that it's like this, this beautiful, you can, you can see, of course, that it has no windows, it has no doors. It's yeah, I was going to ask space. about that. Yeah, that you're kind of wondering, well, how do you enter? And that's, it's that kind of, um, I guess, almost like, the, the opacity of that work and the right to create a space that other people can't really enter. Yeah. 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 I was about to ask you that because I was uh, very interested in, yeah, your thoughts about like not having like an escape or mm -hmm. just, you know, this idea that it, this enclosure also. Yeah. But yeah. We can go to the next slide. These are yeah, more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this work, this is an older work, but um, it's again, it's a work that if we actually go to the next one, we can, well, I'll, I'll say what the chair is. The, the yeah. chair is called the planter's chair. If we go back, sorry. <laughs> um, it's a piece of furniture that was very much created during colonialism where the, the arm rests extend out and double as foot rests and the planter or overseer would have sat in this chair and then someone else would have taken off his boots after his long day of watching other people work and labor in the fields. And so it's kind of the ultimate power chair. Um, this space that it's in is um, a, what's called a great house, these colonial mansions that would have been a part of a slave plantation. Um, and um, I did an exhibition inside of the like different various series of insertions, um, interventions, a video, some other installations and things like that um, for, an, for, an, for an exhibition. And this is one of the works that I did. It was called The Planter's Chair. And it was kind of a performance piece where I invited people that were at the exhibition to do a portrait. So you can see some of the portraits in the next few slides. Um, so they're done in Polaroids and I basically invited people. They could have sat in the chair however they wanted to. And this image, you can see that, um, you know, I didn't realize, you know, part of, again, like a lot of my work is exploratory and uninvestigating. I didn't realize how gendered the chair was. And so mm. not, a lot of women didn't actually feel comfortable sitting in the chair, how it's designed to be seated. seated. Um, but this woman did, and I thought it was a very powerful, very powerful portrait in a way. Um, as you can see, this one, she kind of shifts her weight a bit. But I thought it was really interesting to think about how they would insert themselves into this history, um, how they would position themselves in this chair. Some people wanted to have their families sit in it with them, their mm -hmm. children, their boyfriends, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, it was a very, uh, it, was, it was an interesting piece for sure. I think I did like, about 45 of them, but the, the mm -hmm. piece actually um, got destroyed 
unfortunately. Not in the hurricanes uh, as a lot no. of people have. But yeah, but it's, it's something about Polaroids. The fact that oh, Polaroids, yeah. remember it's a, it's a defunct company? So mm -hmm. I still have one of the original cameras from the 70s or 80s. And I tried to get the original film and these, since the company was destroyed anyway, the, somehow the, the film, it com totally disappeared on me. So it faded out. And so, oh, wow. which is kind of interesting, but it's, they're totally faded. You can't see anything anymore. It's interesting that mm -hmm. like the work decided to do that or not decided, <laughs> but like the conditions. I know, yeah. I know. I don't know if it was the humidity here or what, but the, the yeah. pieces totally just faded out. I don't know, like for some reason, it like, I don't know if it's like this, I guess there's a, a conversation around violence against women. I, like this chairs like speaks to me or like I think about rape. I don't know, like it's... Mm. Yeah, it's a. Uh, you mean in terms of the way the, the chair, the design of the chair. Yeah. yeah, there's something very like taking up space. Of course, you know you're opening and you can see your mm -hmm. genitals in a way. It's like a. It is a different. You know, we have we of course have seen uh, people sit in chairs and they're these. For example, the presidential portraits. So many of them are in chairs and the ways that men will position themselves. But this one has like a sexuality to it. I think yes. that, that I think is. Um, a, a gendered nature to the yeah. imposition of power that I think yeah. probably would make you think about that for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, interesting, yeah. kind of disturbing at the same way. Well, here's another kind of disturbing image. Um, as I mentioned, I, you know, the first time I went to Denmark was in 2008 and I was there doing a residency program and working with an, a curator called Jacob Fabricius on an exhibition um, that we co-curated together and Towards the end of that trip, um, a woman invited me to see her dissertation project, which was she had been investigating all these photo albums of, uh, that were from the Danish West Indian period. And, um, you know, it was families who had lived here during that time and then had donated, somehow they, these photo albums were donated to the National Library and she was writing her dissertation on them. This image of this small black child crying was in so many of those albums. And I was so shocked. I didn't understand. It was a postcard image. I couldn't understand why this image was there. I, it just seared into my memory. Um, and so years later, when my mother was um, sick, she was um, at early stages of Alzheimer's and losing her memory, I kind of went searching for her memories in a way in our own mm -hmm. photo albums. And I saw this image of myself. I don't know if it's the first one that will come up because I know you guys separated them, but let's see the next slide. Yeah. So I found this image of myself on the left and I remembered that it, had lo it looked so much like that image of the crying child that I saw mm -hmm. in terms of composition, just there was some similarities in the image that I thought was interesting. Although in my image, I think there's an ambiguity of if I'm crying or laughing. And also there's a difference because, you know, someone who loves me is taking the picture. Whereas with this other picture, you definitely get the sense that this child has been somehow abandoned and is in distress. You could, you know, you have all these wonderings. But because the text on it said, um, I think it says like uh, St. Croix Pickney. Pickney is like a slave era word that refers to a child um, and it says DWI for Danish West Indies I thought it would be interesting to juxtapose the two images and then overlay a new text that read St. Corey Pickney but then um, I think it says US I can't quite see what it says there but I was kind of def definitely referencing our colonial trajectory our mm -hmm. ambiguous relationship to the United States um, how our bodies factor into that, um, how our innocence factors into that, you know, a lot of different, a lot of different things. So I decided to start seeing if I could find others. I mean, this was kind of a find, you know, this, and I thought maybe there are other images that I can match and create a conversation with. So there are a few more. The next one. Next slide. Mm -hmm. This one, um, it's me on the left. And then there's this image of these two uh, black girls that are weaving, basket weaving, and it says, the text is really crazy. It says, like, they are learning to be useful citizens, which I just thought, like, useful to whom, you know? It was very much, again, the as you talked about before, the violence of the, a particular kind of gaze. Mm 
you yeah. know, like they couldn't just be children. They had to be useful in some ways. Um, and then this image is taken of me when I lived in Wisconsin for one year when my father was going to graduate school. And I was, we were the only black family there. And that, this picture, I'm doing a, a craft in school and someone took a, a newspaper came and I said something. And anyway, they took a picture of me. Mm -hmm. And I always remember my mother saved it and she has her own thing that she wrote on it. But I always remember the feeling of the gaze. That's what I remember. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what connected these two images. Yeah. We can see the next one. And this one is um, definitely talking about class. Uh, in, the, in the archives, it describes this woman as a woman of upper class on the left, and it's signaled by her dress and the kind of building that she's sitting, her hair, et cetera. And there was an image of my mother sit, sitting, standing in front of our house when we lived on St. Thomas with my brother. And there's lots of other signifiers of class that I thought was interesting in this image too, based on her hair, you know, straightening mm -hmm. of her hair, the fact that it's a two-story house, the fact that it's a house on a hill. There's, so it's, again, creating these conversations between the past and, and present. And, and do you, and... how do you install this work? How does it live in the gallery? Um, it's it... just like this. So it's a, it's a photograph that has two images on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I sh usually show them together, all four together. We can go to the next one. Mm -hmm. This one comments on, this was my father on the left. And he was a priest first in the Moravian church. And then he switched to the Anakin church or in the United States, they call it the Episcopal church. And, um, and then here there's an image of what was called an Obiaman, which is a somewhat derogative word to refer to people who practice African um, spiritual practices. And he would have been like a priest or a leader in that. And it's interesting that he's labeled that way in the, in the archive. But I thought it was so interesting juxtaposing that the different senses of presence of these two religious figures and kind of how you can see these narratives of um, the transformation that's, yeah. that's happened and how, how even with my father, like, you know, religion was an extremely colonizing force in the Caribbean and the way that the Christian church was brought in. But at the same time, black people also found ways to take that and announce a kind of presence and kind of transform that, their spirituality, mm -hmm. this, this new form. And I think you very much see that in the way that my father presents himself. Yeah. We go. Can we go to the next, go to the next one? Yeah. yeah. Um, this work, probably the, we can go to the next image because you, you get a mm -hmm. better sense. But, yeah. you know, I started, I, I had, you know, the Virgin Islands is a place that um, we lost our records. Um, so when Denmark sold us in 1917, most of our archives were then taken. Actually, they sent an archivist a few years after. They, they It was like a bad breakup. They took all their stuff. <laughs> stuff that actually wasn't even theirs. They took, for example, all of our indigenous artifacts, too. They're all housed in Danish institutions. And so we've been a community that's had to develop our memory without our archives. And what I found, so I've been very fascinated when in you know, in 2017, which was the 100th year anniversary, a lot of these archives were digitized and made available online. And um, so this was for a project, an online project called Mapping a Colony, where mm -hmm. they commissioned me to do this work. And, you know, the challenge is, it's like, great, we have now access to these archives and we can begin to maybe tell different stories, but the imposition of this colonial gaze is so strong. It, it was like, it's, it's so difficult to maneuver. So I started, um, this piece is, is called How to Survive Colonial Nostalgia and it's me wrestling with that. So I take these images and I wrap them around in a circle. It looks a little bit like El Mal de Ojo, the protected yeah. eye. It looks also a little bit like um, a black hole. So it's, it's kind of layering these different metaphors to wrestle with this idea of the colonial gaze to kind of maybe can I protect myself from it and it's a, it's a piece that juxtaposes text and image. It's a video piece. We can continue on. Yeah, here's another one. So these are all land landscapes. 
Um, the okay. landscape that would have been like this, and they're kind of repeated and wrapped around each other. We'll go to the next one. And here I am going back into these photographs and um, trying to find another way to deal with the colonial gaze. Mm -hmm. And so I started marrying the language of my cuts and burns, where I'm cutting and burning into white paper, and I start cutting and burning into the photographs. And my idea was to cut the black bodies away from the landscape because these images are so constructed to create a colonial order and a way and a, and a particular hierarchy. Um, the black bodies are usually kind of the way that they're even represented next to the white bodies, the way that they're represented next to the land. All of these are very constructed to, to create a particular imaginary. And I just almost wanted to like rescue them in a way mm -hmm. from that. So if you go to the next slide, you can see that I'm- A detail, a, yeah. You can kind of see that I'm cutting and burning um, around them. In, in these kind of amorphous shapes that in some ways the piece is called swarm because it reminded me a bit of, you know, I have a wooden building <laughs> that I'm always dealing with termites and termites kind of, um, it was me kind of thinking about how they're so insidious in the way that they kind of eat away at things. So that's what I'm trying to do in a way, like I'm using the cuts and burns to kind of go back in time and eat away at some of these structures. That's how I envisioned it. So we can go to the next yeah. one. And how is the, like, how do you make it? Like, how is the process of, like, I don't know, I'm really curious yeah. about the Yeah, so what I would do is I would um, print, I would create a print mm -hmm. of the work, and then um, it's a, I don't have one here, I actually sent them to get fixed, but it's a small wood burning tool that has a pen, mm -hmm. and at the tip of the pen, it can heat up, and there, it's usually called uh, pyrography, so it's for people, it's like a craft where you can write on wood and it creates this like dark right like dark impression yeah but I use that tool differently I crank it all the way up so that it's hot enough that it will burn through the through paper yeah and that's how I use it that's how I create that work um and what I like through. also is when yeah. I I haven't had a chance yet to really show this work, but it's, it's, I think we've talked about showing it. It's this yeah. work that I'm hoping can be shown in some kind of plexiglass. So you can see both sides. Um, and so here's a, another example of a, of a, of an image with the great house again, with the white family to the left, um, the black, we don't know if they're family members or serve. They're probably servants, but yeah, um, are, we can show like, right. And I don't know, I'm not sure if I have a, yeah, close up of this one. Yeah, so this is the white family and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so again, you can see the cuts and burns kind of coming up and over the, mm -hmm. you know. If, I'll be honest, I had made this work when that show um, on Netflix, Stranger Things was very popular. Do you remember that? It was like a, in it, there's this blob that they can't, quite see only certain people can see it and it's in the environment and it kind of so I I, I was thinking about that like kind of mm -hmm. this force that could kind of <laughs> come in and and transform these images so that's what that is and to go to the next one yeah so you know as we've been talking about the violence of the colonial gaze um, this project is called Errata and it's I did it in 2017 it's another juxtaposition, another creating and thinking very much about archive. Um, and it's based on a woman that wrote this book. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we have very beautiful colonial towns and um, she was writing a book around these, about these towns to kind of come out around the centennial anniversary. So go to the next slide. And she interviewed me for her book and she was, uh, you know, showcased the work that I was doing on this building and um, then later on when the book came out or a, a preview, someone had gotten a preview of the book and then when they had interviewed me, they were here for another project and they had interviewed me, they were writing their master's thesis about this book, this, this project and about this architect who wrote this book and et cetera. And as she interviewed me, she mentioned to me that there seemed to have been something off in the story and she said, yeah, there's, you told me that you purchased these buildings, but in the book, it says that you inherited them. 
And it also says that you, um, you were related to the women from the 1700s that were the previous owner of this building. And that may seem like an uh, innocuous kind of change in narrative, but it's actually a really violent change yeah. in my narrative because um, for many, many reasons. Um, the first one being is that, you know, it, the buildings had drug addicts living in them. And so in a sense, she's basically saying that my parents gave me a building that was so derelict that drug addicts were living in them, which is kind of insulting to them and their memory and their legacy. Um, but also this kind of preposterous idea that I could have a direct lineage to women from the 1700s. It's a beautiful story, but it's not my story. It's not yeah. true. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of like, how did she come to write these things? So when the person tells me that there's this mistake on the book, I start to write the author and I just ask her, because I know her, I respect her, I like her. I just said, hey, I heard your book came out. Congratulations. Would you... I heard, but there might be a mistake in my story. These are the two things that were brought to my attention. Could you clarify? She writes me back and says she's on holiday, but that she'll look in her notes. She might have gotten some things wrong. And I write her back saying, how could you get something like this wrong? Like, this is a big deal. Like how, you know. So we start a series of engagement. She apologizes privately for a very public mistake, but... I just say to her, like, I want to understand how you came to write these things because I didn't tell you these things. Mm -hmm. um, and so we start a series of emails over six months, <laughs> back and forth. I mean, not writing every day, of course. It, sometimes we'd take breaks. I would get frustrated. But they were, it was a real engagement around narrative, about archive, about the history of these buildings, about our towns, about architecture. Um, she was, we were both quite generous with one another, trying to have a conversation. But it was still quite frustrating. Um, so when I was in Denmark, about six months after this happened, I was preparing for a solo exhibition. And I decided that I wanted to use this as an artwork. Um, I, had to, I had a journalist interview me who had found out about my story in this book. Mm -hmm. We can go to the next slide. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And she. Um, well, in telling her about what happened, you know, I, I told her my story, I told her about the history of the building, and then I, I mentioned to her that there's some errors in this book. I realized that I had, I had the power to correct my narrative. I had been frustrated because there's such an authority around archives and around uh, texts, around books. But I realized, like, in the same way, like, rock, paper, scissors, that art had a particular kind of authority, too. So I could make a work around what happened, and that's what I did. So if we go to the next slide, what I decided to do was to publish the email. So it's, a, it's an installation piece that juxtaposes her text, her book, with the emails that we had had. And the last email is me telling her that I'm going to do this and why I'm going to do it, why it's a conversation around archives. And uh, curators were a little concerned in the beginning because they were like, what is this like? Is this some petty vengeance or something. And I, t I explained to them that no, it wasn't. What I'm actually doing is signaling how archives are created. And I'm putting into question the gaze of the archives because right. if, if that kind of projection could happen to me and I'm alive today and she interviewed me, how much more are the personal letters and all these other narratives that we're reading in these colonial archives as they represent black people in them, how much more should we question the things right. that we see? So it was that that's what the work was about. And it's called errata because that's um, a term usually it happens maybe in self published books where yeah. you have to insert that little page. Yeah. <laughs> so it was me kind that. of inserting yeah. the correction there. That's brilliant. <laughs> Thank know. you. It was hard so, getting for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we can get uh, to the next slide. Yeah. Um, so this is. Uh, reference um as i you know i've mentioned a few times my studio and how significant it has been to my practice outside of it i stumbled upon these stones and um it's these are coral stones that came from the ocean but they were outside my studio and i kind of they were beautiful you could see that they have very straight marks and i tried i had this kind of 
instant memory where I remember the historian telling me that these stones um, were used to be carved out of the ocean by enslaved Africans and that these are the stones that form all the foundations of our buildings. But then what happens, if you go to the next slide, I think it's maybe the next one. Yeah, so what happens is that the Danish bricks, which you see on the right of this wall, that's what gets placed on top. So most of our buildings are actually, this is a very rare wall where you see the coral stones. Most times you, they're covered over. Mm. Um, and so most people, when they think about our buildings, we see them as just Danish architecture and we forget the labor. And this, these stones were kind of like a very visible record of their labor. Like they literally had their hand marked yeah. with them. And so I decided to create a work um, I created one before this, but we're gonna talk about this one first. This is called wall rubbing. So if we go to the next slide, um, what I do is I, I put, a, it's called a quaba paper. It's, a, it's actually a paper that came, I bought from a grave rubbing site. So that, you know, people who wanna make those rubbings on graves. So it's um, with wax, I'm kind of, it's almost like a performance in a way, a piece. I'm kind of creating a record. Of, it's called a record of the work of others. And it's kind of dedicated to the memory of the labor of the enslaved Africans, which are, you know, the true foundations of the wealth of these societies. Um, so this is a, a close up of that work. And then it's reproduced as a wall in the next image. Yeah. And I think what's the next image? Let's see. I'm not sure. Uh, so, yeah, here's another. Here's the, the first piece that I had done. Um, I had. Uh, decided to, I, I had been asked to think about creating a monument around the colonial history and around the centennial, that, that, that 100th year anniversary. And um, this was my first, it was kind of like thinking through that idea of what a, a monument, uh, what would I commemorate? And so this piece is called Trading Post and it's taking those same stones and putting them in, encasing them in plexiglass. and you know, kind of inverting what we think about what plinths are for. We usually put the art on top and we talk about what's mm -hmm. on top. So it's kind of inverting that and thinking about the plinth and that foundation as the actual, um, as the actual work. Yeah. Right? And we have, we have other works um, after this, but this is kind of, it connects to the Queen Mary project that I want to leave space for that. Okay. Because I think it's brilliant. So if we want to like talk a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, the next couple works, I can go through them kind of yeah. quickly. Um, this have, is, like, it's because it leads into what I'm working on right, right now. Mm -hmm. um, so around the pandemic, I returned to a series that I had started way back in 2015 um, that was just taking uh, drawings. I was kind of reimagining that iconic palm tree landscape image of how we think about the Caribbean and re- challenging myself really to kind of how could I engage with this and say something different about it. Um, so this work I started during the pandemic. Um, it's called Storm in the Time of uh, Temporal and Spatial Collapse. And it was very much thinking about all the temporal and spatial collapse that we felt during that, that moment of the lockdowns and the quarantines. And, um, you know, kind of these images of vanishing and disappearing and reappearing islands and in this perpetual storm um, thinking about the resistance, thinking about our bodies, thinking about how to invent new uh, horizons and, and landscapes and um, histories based on these shattered histories. So this is this is kind of what I've, this is my most recent work. This is what I've been working on right now in the studio. Mm -hmm. And I think if we go to the next one, there's a few. Another recent. Uh, this one is another one dealing with bodies and landscape. Um, it was for a commission. Uh, it's dealing with these. Uh, creating a an image of a body, but that's based on the plants that you find at the shoreline. And so this mm -hmm. was for a commission at Brookfield in New York, Brookfield Place. And I think the next image you kind of get to see was a, is a vinyl public art installation. And then I believe the next one should be thinking about I Am Queen Mary. So yeah. um, as I mentioned in 2017, uh, I had been invited along with um, Jeanette Ehlers, who was an uh, our artist from Denmark of Trinidadian and Danish uh, heritage. And we had both been approached to think about think, doing a monument. And she had thought about a performance art piece that she had been working with to kind of create that into a sculpture of a figure. And then I had presented this image dealing with the coral stones. 
Um, if we go to the next slide, we also, the image is referencing that famous portrait of Huey P. Newton, um, who's the leader, one of the leaders of the Black Panther Party. And then we also decided to marry that with uh, the narrative of Queen Mary, who this is an early depiction of what she might have looked like. Um, but it's, she was the leader of the, one of the leaders of the Firebomb, which is this, the largest labor revolt in Danish colonial history. And so by combining, we not only decided to combine our two monument ideas, we decided to combine our physical bodies to create <laughs> the figure by doing 3D body scans of our bodies, thinking about creating a bridge and our bodies being this register of our histories. And um, so it's a, it's a 3D body scan and composite of Jeanette and myself to create the figure that's in this uh, 24 foot sculpture, which is combining again, the coral stones on the bottom and then the figure on top. And it's called I Am Queen Mary. Mm -hmm. Very much again, thinking about how do you, how, does, how do we insert ourselves into this history? Um, and it's currently, we inaugurated in 2018 in front of the Danish West Indian warehouse. Um, it's since been, because we had only raised money, this is a totally artist driven project, it's not commissioned. We decided that we wanted to continue with this project to raise all the money for it. We were able to raise enough to do a temporary version of the monument and we were finally granted permanent permission last year and we're about to launch our fundraising campaign to do a permanent version and also one in the Virgin Islands. Part of the reason it ended up in Denmark first was because Denmark is a wealthy country. They had put all yes. this money up for the centennial. <laughs> and so Jeanette had been able to apply to Danish foundations and get it there. But now we're hoping to be able to kind of decolonize in that way the power of that project or the power yeah. positions in that project and to also get one in the Virgin Islands. And this is a version of it that was created in uh, 2019. Uh, it was commissioned by the Ford Foundation for an exhibition um, there. And as you can see, this one is a more human scale version and yeah. closer to the original idea of the way that the coral stones have been. Designed. Is it still there at the university? It's right now at Barnard College. Yeah. Yeah. In, you can go. Yeah, you can go. It's 24 hours. That building is open 24 hours. So it can be, it's on loan there right now. For so those of you that are in New York, it's uh, like, it's amazing. It's an amazing work. I was there for the inauguration and it was really a very yeah. emotional day. It was a very emotional day, especially because, you know, Columbia is a colonial institution. It used to be called yes. King's College. And so for Black people of color and Black people, especially there, I think it was so radical to have a sculpture like that in their main hall. It mm -hmm. definitely shifts and transforms that space a lot. Um, but I would encourage everyone, again, as I said, we're about to launch our fundraising campaign. So you can follow it at support I am Queen Mary on our Instagram. You can also go to our website, I am Queen Mary, and sign up so that when we launch it, um, we can definitely raise the money to finish the project. It's amazing. And how can you talk a little bit more about like merging the two image, images and like, I mean, you were talking about it the other day with me but i like i want to learn more about like this how is it called um like virtual reality uh, yeah yeah so what we're also about to launch right so because the figure was made um of polystyrene i mean it's not in bronze yet um polystyrene is basically like a high density foam like a styrofoam but but a little more sturdy than the commercially named styrofoam um And so it, it's three, it's not 3D printed. It's actually milled out of large oh, wow. blocks of styrofoam. So it's milled out like this and then it's pieced together and then painted. Um, but it, it became like a wind sail uh, on the Copenhagen Harbor. And so it got damaged several times. So we had to take the figure down and the base, the coral stones are still there. But we decided as we're raising our money and you know, to make a bronze sculpture of that size takes time we need to hold the place. So we're about to do an augmented reality version of the sculpture that's gonna be launched in a few weeks. Um, and it's, it's so fascinating because of course, the augmented reality version isn't like a picture of the sculpture as it stood in reality. It's actually the digital image of us that is now going wow. to be 
um, on the plinth when you hold up your phone. So we're excited about that. It's totally new technology that mm -hmm. some, we were lucky enough to get these developers that used to work for NASA. And wow, um, yeah, we're, we're very, very excited. It's actually a bit, I think it's probably one of the, you know, it's going to be one of the first public art projects like that in the way that it is, because it's totally fixed to the location. Mm -hmm. So we're excited. Yeah. That soon. I'm, I'm curious to know, like, with all these conversations around monuments, did you ever uh, experience some vandalism or just backlash with these pigs? Oh, my gosh. Have we? We've got how many more minutes? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> we have five minutes. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. Have we? Yes, we've had backlash on both sides of the Atlantic for various reasons. Um, one, on the Danish side, um, some people are very threatened by a two and a half story black female figure. Um, whether they think that it's campy or they think that how can we venerate a person who was considered an arsonist. In the Danish colonial record, she's an arsonist because she burnt down plantations. She was, con she was convicted, sentenced to death, then her You know, she was sent to prison in Denmark eventually. Um, so there's this question of how do you commemorate comp complicated figures um, that have different ways that have different ways that they're being remembered. In the Virgin Islands, we have a highway named after her. We sing songs after her. She's our, our national heroine. Um, some of the with that, some of the backlash in the Virgin Islands was how dare you put your image like mm -hmm. blasphemous? How dare you put your image in Queen Mary? Even though there's no, you know, pictures of her, we don't know what she looks like. That also had um, some backlash on this side of the Atlantic. So it's been, it's a very, you know, complex, it, it brings up all these questions about commemoration, about representation, about mm -hmm. what is the, what is, is there, how do you commemorate colonial history? How do you commemorate difficult histories? Yeah. Um, questions around reparations uh, even even the black body in bronze because mm -hmm. there was a pushback saying well why are you guys now putting it in bronze aren't you kind of like just uh using the language of patriarchy without even thinking about the benin bronze or that bronze is not something that is only uh, uh owned by european history in a way you know mm -hmm. and, and the way that it's been used in monuments so there's um there's so much i think that's why the projects uh when it came out in 2018 you know we had such worldwide attention around it um part of it was yes we we actually hired a pr firm to help us because we needed that because remember our mm -hmm. project was temporary and we needed attention around it to get engagement so that we could get, get the capital to right. argue that it needed to be permanent um But I think, you know, even the PR company, we were totally surprised at how it was reported in over 100 media outlets around the world in over 25 countries with a reach of 1 billion people in a yeah. one month campaign. <laughs> and we were trending on Twitter. I mean, it was, it was, and what that showed us was that, and this is again, this is before what happened last year with George Floyd and this, uh, yeah. you know, attention again around the monuments. Um, it was in between that and what happened in North Carolina. So we were kind of that first questioning of, if we're going to question some of these monuments, what comes after? Right. And I think we're kind of one of the forefronts in these questions yeah. about what can come after. Yeah. Uh, and a year after, or, you know, two years after, there were like, you know, monuments were just, you know, being destroyed, like colonial yeah. monuments. And yeah. it, was, it was amazing to see that. It was, but I think it also <laughs> speaks to, because monuments had almost kind of been forgotten. I mean, they've always right. been contested, but they kind of can become invisible in a public space. And I think what people realize is that, no, they have tremendous power. They, they communicate these messages around power and visibility and value. And it was not by mistake that people went to attack them in some right. ways as a, yes. as a protest. Um, yeah. that, I think it speaks a lot to the violence that a lot of the monuments can have um, mm -hmm. and the power that they can have as yeah. well by creating new ones. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lavon. I think we are at the end of our talk. It was I perfect wish... timing, too. <laughs> I know, no, I, like, I have it timed, <laughs> trust me. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And everyone, please follow Lavon and follow her project. It's amazing. And uh, can you repeat again the website for... Yes. Um, 
So the website for the project is IamQueenMary.com. And mm -hmm. on Instagram, the handle to support our fundraising campaign as well is support I Am Queen Mary. But if you go to the website and sign up uh, to find out more information, we're about to launch in the next few weeks. Okay. Great. Thank you so much.